just talked to Cherith V. Nordling. Second time we've had her on the podcast. And I can't tell you how much I love um, just just talking with her before or after or during. <laughs> there are some folks where you just feel a kinship uh, immediately. And, and I felt that with her uh, the first time we had her on. Deep well, uh, deep thinker but never leaves a practical theology. Uh, She can break down scripture with the best of them, but uh, always for the purpose of being loved, knowing that we're loved, knowing that we're valuable. She speaks to our humanity in ways that really are are liberating. Yeah, just uh, listening to her talk uh, is good for my heart and for my soul and I think it'll be that way for you guys I'm telling you we d- we did dive into our our inerrant value how how Jesus feels about us we talked about Jesus uh, the Holy Spirit father uh, 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 being our hermeneutic how we approach understanding and scripture and 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 even life and how we approach one another and uh, she had invited me to share what was burning in my heart, and so I actually did share with her uh, a question I had around Jesus in the temple with a whip, uh, something I've been processing for the last several months, in which she blew my mind, um, being able to speak to that, especially coming into the season that we are coming into uh, as, a, as, a, as America. It's an election year, and so there's a whole lot that she addresses um, and then, you know, she shares about the journey her and her husband, Robert, have been on, uh, how he's been uh, fighting a sickness uh, and, and a very serious sickness. Uh, she shares about that. She shares about the peace that they have discovered in this season and the life they've discovered in this season. Powerful conversation. And uh, we'll do it again. Definitely do it again one of my favorites she's one of my favorite people um guys love doing this thankful for you uh thankful to be on this journey with you honored really uh that i get to have these conversations with such amazing folks and record them to some end uh it's really enlightening and and uh, encouraging and empowering for me and i love that i get to do it uh and that others are blessed by it as well if you want to join our Facebook group, you can go to uh, Rethinking God with Tacos on Facebook. Lots of community taking place there, conversations. It's a place where kindness is the foundation of every interaction. And, and when it isn't, uh, we just participate in a deeper kindness. Uh, you can find us on Instagram as well under the same title, Rethinking God with Tacos. My daughter uh, runs that, but I'm there. Uh, Madeline is doing a great job on that. Also, if you'd like to keep up with us, you can go to afamilystory.org and sign up for our mailing list. Um, You can also give there. We are a listener-supported podcast and very grateful for that type of partnership. Guys, this is my conversation with Cherith V. Nordling. That's good. That's good. Amen. It is. Listen, I have been... um, I've been looking forward to this. This is, uh, we've only really had one conversation, but it was like talking to an old friend. Oh, that's uh, great. Instead of an interview, um, I, 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 Derek and I at the time were com- connected with you and, and we were um, enriched for days spending mm-hmm. time with you. I, I got an email from you this morning. We talked about it a little bit before I hit record where um, you were responding to some of the questions, some of the, you know, the facts that we were connecting today and uh and you um i i i had talked about wanting to find out what was burning in your heart and you flipped the script and and responded by asking i think you said what's brewing in me which i like too because that's coffee but <laughs> but uh i i got a little emotional uh i because I, I i thought i don't think i've ever gotten an email um where the guest is uh asked if they what was burning anyway i actually stopped i actually stopped and went oh that's a let me let me take some time to that's a good question Mm -hmm. you know the heart behind these conversations is that uh that i would be more convinced in his love today Mm -hmm. than i was yesterday Mm -hmm. Uh, 
and that we would find it together and in the process maybe um, uh, of us discovering together the love of God, the goodness of our Father, that we would be a, have a safe conversation for folks to kind of eavesdrop in on. So Paul Young says, uh, said at one point when we were talking, he said, everything in my life has led to this moment right here. Mm. And I feel that with you. I feel like uh, I feel it from you. And I, so thank you. I'm so, I'm, so, I'm just glad that we're here. We could just sit here and just talk, talk uh, <laughs> about what's going on in our lives. I felt the same way. I was like, oh, I see this. I see this. We haven't like chickened with each other. So I still hope we're having this conversation today because I really love that guy and I would love to be in this space <laughs> together. So I'm glad we get to be here. Amen. Amen. So, yeah. Normally I give a couple of days warning. It's been a, um, a little <laughs> wild, but, but uh, we were talking before you got on about a little bit that's going on in your life. And I know you're in Matthew at the, with the open table with some amazing folks. Share a little bit about that and, and what you're doing right now. Yeah. So for those who are not familiar with open table, um, I wasn't <laughs> for, right. until a few years ago. I knew a couple of the people who were part of that, um, one as a friend and others sort of as names and books and faces and whatnot. But um, Open Table, I think, just became a safe space to ask really hard questions for people who were wondering whether the Christianity that they had sort of inherited was the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? Like whether yeah. there was a Lord who loved them um, yeah. Whether there was someone to know and be known by, or whether there was a religion that had sort of right. taken over that relationship, yeah. and that the religion was killing them, right? The moralism was killing them. The the doctrines that get woven into what we call the gospel um, were just doing great harm. And so when I met up with that bunch, I think it's now about three and a half years ago. And we did a weekend conference. I think that's what they were mostly doing was weekend conferences. I think you can find that as open table conference, actually, if you're looking yeah. online. And and that weekend conference was really fun. I felt like I, suddenly I, I found a people who were in a conversation that mattered to me and, and they yeah. were feeling the same way. Like, wow, we could sort of finish each other's sentences in terms of our curiosity <laughs> or our wonder or yeah. the things we love about the Lord. And and then they were like, hey, you know, we we should uh, think about doing a Bible study together. And my little heart just warmed. I thought, oh, it's been so many years where you're not always the person teaching. It would be so fun to just come and like read scripture together weekly. And that would be awesome. Yeah. So I yeah. came and I got online because it was COVID. And then I heard uh -huh. them, somebody say in the background, um, well, people are beginning to populate this space. And I was like, what? I thought it was the six of us having like this little Bible study. <laughs> and then somebody's like, yeah, they're just coming in by the hundreds. And I just had this like panic attack. Like, what? And so I just, after the first couple of weeks, I was like, I think I need to come off this panel. Um, and it wasn't for anything that was happening in that space. It was actually having to reckon with the places in my own life that I really needed some healing after coming. Wow out of some tough academic spaces where we too had forgotten, right? Or yeah. my sense of safety in that space that we were forgetting what our call was really, which yeah. is to keep equipping the saints for ministry and not bringing more to that about ourselves and our programs and our egos or keeping our institutions afloat or all the other yeah. stuff that gets happen that happens in academic circles. So anyway, I had a little bit of fear and trembling around that and and was just encouraged to stay the course. And it has been <laughs> such a healing community for me and so much fun. So the first year we did John, the next year we did John's Apocalypse. Last year we did Hebrews. And yes, this year we're in Matthew to this afternoon we're picking up on Matthew 20. And it's just been a very delightful space because sort of as you originally invited me to come into this podcast with you the first time. And then again today, it's yeah. the hope is that when we hang out together, we love Jesus better for having yeah. been together. And then you leave going, Oh, 
I had no idea that it was that much better. Or, Lord, thank you that in the ways that I just can't hold this right now in all the yeah. complexity or the weariness or the suffering or whatever, that there's a community that can hold the gospel with me, who can bear witness to who you are. And I need to stay present to you by people who will not relent in yeah. sitting under your goodness and the way that you interact with the world. Right. And yeah. so, uh, yeah, for those who just wonder whether it's worthwhile continuing to kind of be vulnerable in those spaces where you just study scripture together, one of the beautiful things about open table as well that you and I were chatting about before is I'm learning with this, um, group because each of them in their own way and myself included we're we're all coming to scripture in a fresh way where we feel like we're being invited to let Christ be the interpreter right and yeah. and you know in Craig Keener's language also like what is a spirit hermeneutic what is it to entrust the fact that it's not just the holy spirit who's like going to enliven us to be like you know, bright young things who pick up something really meaty to chew on for a minute in the scripture or right. something to give away in a sermon, but to be like, oh, can I hear and know the love of my father in heaven Come on, through yeah. the voice of the one who speaks with him yeah, as well as for him and in him? And can I find my place at the table in like the Rublev icon picture? Like, can I see myself pulled up, pulled the seat out, plopped down, <laughs> and in front of that kind of Eucharistic space, be like, oh, this is the space that was made for me before the foundation of the earth. And there are just a bazillion brothers and sisters sitting here with me. Yeah. And to trust that in the reading of scripture with Jesus, to say, I want you to keep hearing my scripture as the unveiling of God, whose final revelation is me, yeah, right? Wow. And the embodied <laughs> revelation of God is me. Yeah, so wow. scripture doesn't get, be, get to be a different revelation. It yeah. gets to align or it needs to be held in its humanness as well. Come on. As ways where if this is bearing faithful witness to me within the human condition and ways where you'd better sit very still yeah. and ask whether the ways that you're listening to this and reading into this have a lot more to do with your interpretive lens as a child who's fearful to come to that table or broken yeah. at that table yeah. than the one who comes and sits down and touches the ones at that table and finds herself healed into that space that without fear, yeah. you get to learn the family story right and yeah yeah because you yeah. already know how it turns out because you're sitting yeah. across from him <laughs> so anyway it's been a very powerful very really fun experience and everybody brings their unique way to do that but it's been good. lots of amazing folks too brad jerzak there i think paul yeah. young um just a, a, a incredible people I, I hold on so you the first time you were on there you didn't realize that this was a public oh, no. forum <laughs> <laughs> and then I got off and just was like, wait, how do I like graciously excuse myself from this experience? And I think if it had been for a few people, like from very different walks of my life being like, hey, like texting or emailing, like, it was so great to see you in that open table space. And I was like, oh, what? Like, you know about this? Like, you knew more about this than I did coming to this thing. But it also was like, oh, like people from my vineyard world or my Anglican world or my Christian Reformed world. I was like, oh, like, we're all at this open table. I I can sit here and stay here. And people prayed me into the courage to stay there. And so here I, I love am. That you a stayed. Lot of I love that you stayed. I've, it's like being... Um, visiting a church and the pastor saying, oh, Jason, you're here. Why don't you preach today? <laughs> you're like, oh, hey, man, uh, that's beautiful. I, I, um, a lot of what you're saying is, is post you processing a God that does separation or a God who counts our sins against, like it's a lot of what you've just shared 
uh, has so much liberty on it because mm -hmm. you've already processed through a God who is for us. Mm -hmm. You've processed through our humanity in the context of Jesus, not just showing us who the Father is, but showing us what it looks like to live confident as one of his kids or what it looks like to be human, inviting mm -hmm. us into humanity as not some second-class reality, but an actual invitation into the original plan uh, mm -hmm. and the rebirth of that through Christ. For me, uh, probably 15 years ago, when um, I had a profound conversation with God uh, that invited me into um, a scary place at the time because I didn't know I was allowed to do it. I didn't tell anybody I was doing it. But mm -hmm. essentially, I stopped reading scripture for two years. Mm -hmm. um, I only read the Gospels. I did it on the foundation of a message I'd heard many, many times by a fellow by the name of Bill Johnson who said, Jesus is perfect theology. And I took him at his word because it took two years mm -hmm. uh, of, of me having to step away from uh, the context of separation, a, a dualistic perspective, a moralistic approach to life, uh, trying to get to God instead of living from God. Uh, this place of of union, mm -hmm. um, thinking about eternity as a destination instead of the ever present now, mm -hmm. it took it took two years to reset my lens. Mm -hmm. And on the back side of that, I came into the place that allows you to even read read scripture the way you're talking about that it, that that gives you the liberty, if you will. For me, it did. Uh, I couldn't go outside of of the of the gospels because even in the new testament i'd find stories where uh, my retributive lens got got pushed back down upon me this punishing god who looks away at the cross instead of, mm -hmm. of god in christ reconciling right the father mm -hmm. who doesn't leave her forsake in my day of trouble he did not turn his face from me right mm -hmm. and so for me that shift allows for me to to to, to suddenly uh, uh process scripture where I'm looking, not just for uh, what God is like in Christ, but how he really feels about us, mm. uh, Old Testament and new. Mm. It was like I got a new lens, if that makes sense. That said, I've listened to you process through Gnosticism, this Gnostic approach. That I was like, oh my gosh, that was myself. That was my understanding <laughs> of the gospel. <laughs> We're good heretics together, is what you're telling me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, it was a whole. It was a, it, well. You could you could speak. You know, I've. You know, it was a cosmic battle in the heavenlies. You know, God versus Satan. Creation comes out of the rubble. Souls are trapped in human bodies. You know, there's a there's a secret formula. These are I'm I'm quoting some of what I read. I've heard you say a secret formula yeah. that get the souls saved back into some spiritual cosmos uh, outside of our bodies. It de devalues our humanity. It makes uh, it makes our salvation transactional. And that's the stuff that I think you navigated so that you can find yourself willing to to go to a another open table meeting and just be vulnerable. <laughs> <Keep showing up. laughs> yeah, it is. I just read something the other day that just sparked that memory. And I because it, it was really in passing. Now I'm going to go have to go back and find it because what you said is so important. Um, so this is a paraphrase, and I, I can't remember where I found it, but I was reading something the other day, and it just said in passing something about the Gospels, and it's like, because the Gospels were written to, to give a frame for the epistles. Right. Right? Like, the epistles don't come later as like well now let's like dig into like the meaty theology of the gospel right. it's like right no these people are just desperately trying to to pastor yeah crazy young christians right who are yeah. a lot yeah. of them very gnostic a lot of them very like what what do you mean like life in our body would actually matter to god right or jews were yeah. like of course it does but it's all about moralism, right? Like just like, right. no, for Paul to be, especially just Paul to be like, no, 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 I, I met him, right? Like I, he taught me, right? That blows my mind. I was, I was in a conversation the other day with some um, ordinance and some priests and they were like, 
as they were talking about the sacrament of, of the Lord's table, it's like this language of like first Corinthians 11, where Paul's really not like, okay, now I just need a time out to like talk about communion, right? Like, yeah. you know, I've covered a couple topics. Here's what he's like, look, I, we just need to talk about the fact that there is so much division that's just yeah. running through your church body around so many different things. And it's just killing you, right? It's killing yeah. you as a people. It's killing yeah. you individually. It's, it's disabling you from being able to hear the voice of the Lord, because if you did, you would be speaking that voice of love, right? That yeah. would be like, I don't, what you do in the spirit is not the big stuff unless it's the character of God by the spirit to enact the love and speak the words of love to God. And so why would you give that away to like the Agora when, when you have a dispute, like you just told me like you're wise ones and actually by the spirit you are. So sort it out. Like in the way that looks <laughs> like Jesus, like why did you think they would be able to tell you better what God himself would love to show you for the sake of this wow. city, right? Like, just wow. like, so let's talk about the fact that you're withholding sexual relations because you think that, like, he's coming back tomorrow and and right. that what you do in your marriage bed isn't important anymore. He's like, but maybe it would be, right? Like, if, <laughs> if your marriage wow. is a way for the world to see something or, like, like, he's just kind of going down, like, and then let's talk about, the fact that some of you want to claim the rights and privileges that that are about like what you can eat and drink because you are like holy and like he's yeah. just like getting at all this stuff because he's hearing all of this right and he knows these people that's what i love right like he knows these people right very right. well because he's loved them and lived with them and pastored them for about two years and so he's like oh, okay i got this letter from chloe's people <laughs> and like go what the heck <laughs> <laughs> but I love that, like, when he finally is, like, talking about, like, that communion meal, he's like, this would be the place. This is the invitation. This is Jesus' invitation to go, whatever you're doing, when you go into a temple, you are bearing witness to the truth of that God. And what you do in that space actually is in some way, whatever the ritual is, it it participates in what you think is the character of that God. Yeah. Yeah. So whether it's like a God that's a bloodthirsty one, well, you're going to do a lot of slaughter in that space, right? If you're looking for love and fertility, then there's a lot of sex in that space. But he's like, yeah. So what you're doing by eating <laughs> in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is one with the Father and you by the Spirit, and then you eat and drink a meal that actually is in his name and to wear his character, and you truck in all of this stuff. Does it look anything like Jesus, right? Yeah. You're bringing hierarchy and power dynamics yeah. and <laughs> poverty and like all this yeah. stuff. He's like, what are you doing? But he, he's, when he finally just says, look, I'm going to just tell you what the Lord gave me. Like not the apostles by telling yeah. him like, wow, when we were sitting with him at the Passover supper, he's like, no, the Lord gave this to me. Yeah. And he doesn't say this is my body broken for you. Paul says, this is my body, which is for you, right? You wow. are the one loaf. You, people of Corinth, are the body. And, wow. and I was just sitting there thinking about that the other day, like, oh, when would Paul hear that? Like, we could speculate. Right. And then all of a sudden, I was like, no, no, no. Like, sure, do you know the answer to that question? Like, this is Jesus who meets Paul and says, Saul, why yeah. are you persecuting me? Come on. And he's like, yeah. who? Who are you? He's like, I'm Jesus. And immediately you're like, oh, this is his body, right? Wow. This is my body, which is for you Wow. to be a people together who look like me in the world so that the world can look at you and know what I look like in your hmm. human lives together. So None of this Gnosticism, because I've met him. Like, if we read Acts, he's like, I've met him three times, let alone whatever Jesus was talking to him about for 14 years in preparation for Paul's own ministry. But I say all those things to think, this is a pastor who just can't get enough of Jesus, right? He's like, to live is Christ, but to die is like, I can't, then I get to be with him. But he's wow. like, anything that you're reading 
that sounds like retributive justice from Paul isn't Paul. Yeah. Right? Anything that we're reading that wants to be like the theologies of the different eras of the church traditions, and then we want to land those on this Jewish man who has no fear of just having people like kill him. Like every Jeez. few minutes, like every page, yeah. you're like, yeah. and who's going to kill him next? And he's like, that's okay. I'm yeah. in love with the one who raises the dead. And he, I'm yeah. exhibit A for a yeah. grace that never, ever, ever looked like what I thought it was. or a, And a God who never looked like what I thought he would. He yeah. looks like this servant person. <laughs> yeah. he's, so I think in some ways to be able to hang out in the Gospels, and I really hear you. I've been in those spaces, too, where I just had to stop being in the churchy conversations because they were so loaded by so many other layers of doctrine that had nothing to do with what those letters were saying. Yeah. yeah. But the letters became the launch pads or the justifications for a lot of ways that we were thinking. But to sit with Jesus and then realize, oh, these gospels are being written well after these epistles oh, right. are being written. And these folks know these people who are writing these epistles <laughs> and trust <laughs> them and love them yeah. and go, yeah. yep, yeah. yep, yeah. that's that's our Jesus, right? And yeah. not the Jesus of memory, but to say this is the ascended Lord Jesus. This is yeah. This is uh Psalm 110.1, 110.4, right? This is the thing that runs through the New Testament is like 25 times of what's the one thing that we want to claim is that guy who some of us knew here. And then Paul's like, yeah. and then I met him too, like one untimely yeah. born. He's like, this person who we all thought was just this man, yeah. now we're saying Jesus and we're putting the name God next to him. And it's blowing our minds. <laughs> you and I, like we're so used to hearing the God side, we can't give back the human side. But they're just like, this yeah. is why the New Testament was just full of Lord language. Right? They're just like, can you believe it? Like, he's the Lord. Like, he's God. Like, you can say <laughs> Yahweh and Jesus in the same sentence and it's real. And... So they do. And I think that to be able to then just have the refreshing of the orneriness of a world that doesn't want him, right, in the yeah. form of religion yeah. and people who just can't figure out what the heck he's doing and they don't want him because it doesn't help them feel better about themselves, per se, yeah. and the disciples before they know him in the resurrection. And even then they don't know him, right? It takes the spirit. Yeah. They just don't. Yeah. They don't know yeah. what they're signed up for. But I love that none of us really know. We just have to yeah. keep knowing and knowing and knowing by meeting him over and over and over again mm. and letting this one, who is the gospel. That's what Father um, John Bear in the Open Table group, he really gets at us when we say, like, the gospels or... I forget how our loose language is, because every once in a while he'll be like, you know, in our tradition, when we say this, or in your Anglican tradition, Sheriff, or whatever, because when you have the gospel reading, he said, it's any any little section of the gospel of Mark or Matthew, whatever you're reading, because it is the on-ramp to the whole gospel. Come on. So wow. you should be able to just hear that story and be able to go, Woo, right and then yeah. they come back to the narrow beauty of the moment but then go oh, now i know the whole story what is this little part like helping me see and he's like wow. always the whole gospel who is this person is present in this moment and so can you let him speak right and yeah. and so here's my last like little moment of chris green a couple weeks ago in open table had um chapter 17 on the transfiguration. And he said, you know, isn't it powerful that in Matthew's telling, they are not afraid like they are in the other, the disciples who see Jesus, Moses and Elijah, they have this, you know, unspeakable visual, yeah. You know, yeah. Un the uncreated light sort of presence of them. He goes, in the other gospels, like they're afraid by that whole thing. He says, in Matthew's gospel, they're seeing it. And they're like, this is awesome. And they think they know what they're seeing. 
Sure. Right. And you're kind of leaning yeah. in and just, yeah. it's let's not build a, let's build a fort. Right? Yeah. And like, let's, let's <laughs> make it last longer. And, <laughs> and then he says, then when the father speaks, it says, but this is my son whom I love. Mm -hmm. And it goes, listen to him. Yeah. Listen to this one who speaks. He goes, that's when they get terrified. Like, <gasps> wow. And then the, for the rest of the thing, it's like, and what is he trying to tell you? And he's just told you and is going to keep telling you and move you to Jerusalem, which is that God loves you this way. Wow. And I will put to death all the things that are killing you from being able to be the human children of God, but it will cost your life to get your life yeah. back. And so watch my son, but watch me as God showing you that it costs this, but resurrection is the only response and it's the divine response, right? And so it's just a powerful moment to think, wow, Jesus really wants to speak to us. And the father wants to say, listen to him, because yeah. if you listen wow. to him, you'll meet me. Listen to him. You'll begin to recognize the voice of the spirit compared to your own retributive spirit, your own fearful spirit, your own justice oriented spirit that <laughs> wow. isn't kissing righteousness right it's a different kind of justice i think i think it's just been such a welcoming way of being in that conversation i i am um, there's so much there cherith um i'm reminded of when you were talking about paul uh how good he was at rediscovering grace and yes. i you know he at one point he tells us about a thorn and he says three times I prayed and then he makes this profound statement. Oh, and then I remembered and then I remembered that grace is sufficient and even goes on to give profound insight. Uh, you know, we have the children's song. I am weak and he is strong, which is mm -hmm. true, but that's not actually what Paul says there. Right. After he discovers grace, he says, and when I'm weak, I am strong. Yeah. And, you know, that that willingness to die over and over again uh, comes to the comes. It's connected to resurrection life. It's the discovery that when you take up your cross and follow him, it's it's actually an invitation to die to all the things that are killing you, yeah. to all the false narratives, all the the ego, all, all of the ideology around separation and our and our broken uh, obsession with it. Yeah. Um, I think and all there's the fear something that's under all the fear, all that, right? It's all fear yeah. based. It's all um, fear based. Fear and shame based. Yeah, and fear having to do with punishment. Again, yes. back to that retributive yes. perspective. How do you how do you get set free from this fear? There's a perfect love that casts it out. That that is an invitation into union, into oneness, into a um, a way to walk with God where you're. Um, where you, well, I'll, I'll, that's a road I don't want to go down because I'm going to turn a different direction. But <laughs> here will I say, oh, oh, oh. Hey guys, interrupt him for a second. Glad you're here. So thankful for this podcast. Thankful to get to do this with friends. Thankful for Derek and all of those who've navigated it with us. Listen, this podcast is done under our nonprofit, A Family Story. Twelve years ago, I had a vision and I wrote it down. I'm going to read it to you. Family Story is a relational community of creatives, family and friends. I see all of us as creatives. We do life together. We envision and express God's love through our gifting and grace. We are worshipers, dreamers, storytellers, and preachers, a family of dads and moms, brothers and sisters, daughters and sons, united by a passion to know and reveal God's perfect love. I feel like I'm seeing the fulfillment of some of that vision. 12 years ago. Uh, the mandate on A Family Story was to create media content catalytic for an encounter with the love of God. AfamilyStory.org is our website. I encourage you to go there. There's a whole lot of media content there. There's books and articles. Uh, there's films, some music, and uh, this podcast. That's the home of Rethinking God with Tacos, which is pretty dang cool. It's been life-giving, as I said, the community around it, the community of creatives of family and friends that's growing, uh, it's blown me away. And so I'm thankful. I'm thankful uh, for all the relationships, connections, and I'm thankful for all those who've given. Rethinking God with Tacos is listener-supported. 
If you'd like to support us, you can go to familystory.org. Uh, again, we're a nonprofit. And I would encourage you to join us on our Facebook group. Uh, follow us on Instagram, all the socials. Uh, if you're curious how to find me on the socials, it's at Jason Clark is. Otherwise, like, share, uh, write a review on iTunes or Spotify. Uh, tell your mom. We really are loving doing this, and I'm so thankful for everyone here. All right, it's time to get back to the podcast. I, you also talk about justice, and and uh, based off of the email you sent me, mm -hmm. I thought, you know, this is something I'm processing right now, and I would love to process this with Cherith. I, mm -hmm. I'd be curious that you get your thoughts on it and, and pushback or whatever, but for 10 years or so, I read the story of Jesus and the temple. You know, he, he comes in the temple and he sees the way that the leadership is um, abusing the people, the, the, all that's going on there in the temple. And it says he, he braided a whip, it took the day to do it, and then he came back and, and drove the moneylenders and the, and the uh, animals, uh, mm -hmm. and flipped some tables as, as he did it. Mm -hmm. And uh, for 10 years, uh, I processed this story. Uh, in the context, this is a conversation in the context of justice. For 10 years, I processed this story, taking a retributive whip out of Jesus's hand. Mm. Because for so long, I had been raised, you know, if you're, if you're discovering Jesus's perfect theology, there is no uh, retributive nature in him. The Father doesn't look away. So I'm getting settled in all these things. Then you begin to revisit all of these places where mm -hmm. a retributive God had been put upon you, even, even Jesus himself. And so mm. I, I spent years pulling the retributive whip out of his hand and 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 uh, realizing that um it took a day to to do it so it wasn't reactionary right. you know it wasn't it wasn't reactionary that was one my first thought then there's nothing here that says he struck people and that, and mm -hmm. anything that would suggest that is counter to everything else we know about Jesus so to suggest that and to weave that into the narrative is a, a, a very flawed way so I, I'm, I'm processing that and then I'm processing what authority looks like Jesus did everything in the context of cruciform love which means authority to flip tables is connected to your willingness to die for the person on the other side of the table mm -hmm. so now I'm processing what justice looks like in the context of flipping tables and I'm saying okay uh, we need uh, the type of people who will lay their lives down for the person on the other side of the table. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Okay, mm -hmm. now you have the authority to flip the table. Otherwise, it's reactionary. You're just making a bigger mess. Jesus did everything in the context of cruciform love. So this is what I'm processing over 10 years. In the last little bit, and coming into an election season mm -hmm. in the world we live in today, um, I'm now trying to, I'm trying to process that Jesus did use um, a tool mm -hmm. in a forceful manner. And this may be, may be too clunky. I don't know if you've got anything, but I, you go I'm, for processing, it. I'm processing right now in the light of a, of a, a, a need for um, uh, justice that is restorative. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking of all things in the context of God is in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting our sins against us. He's not in the sin counting business. He's always in the restoration business. Mm -hmm. So in the context of restoration, now I'm looking at it and going, there was, what does it mean to have a restorative whip? Is that the wrong language? I don't know if you have any thoughts about this. And I know that I've thrown it at you without giving you any heads up, but no, I'm processing that right now. What does wisdom look like in that capacity? Is there anything that resonates there with you or do you want me to push delete? <laughs> no, no, no. It's such a good, we, you have to start where you were starting, right? And I am, I love that that's been a really potent image for you for a long time, right? Yeah, so right. of course it would be a really important place where Jesus could start talking to you, right? Yeah, because that's how it works. Yeah, why would that's he, right pick something that you haven't been thinking about at all. And then you'd be like, yeah, but how do I put that together with this other thing I would think of? Yeah, that's exactly right. So yeah. I, I think he's like, great, uh, let's start there. Yeah. And yeah. so maybe a couple of things to What's that story with... like for you? Yeah. Like, w yeah. That story has been, 
has been really been so I just have to like just say it like that story has been reshaped for me in the yeah. open table context in the last couple of years because we've had okay. to think about that right yeah yeah so yeah. for instance with um with looking at the apocalypse which we did I was the person who had revelation 18 and it's like yeah. this really like dire chapter of like all the woes right and Babylon which is actually the language for Jerusalem, which is the language of the temple, yeah. right? Because what's the center of Jerusalem, but the temple. And, and one of the things that, so this is just like a little nerdy, but I think it's an important moment, which is that one of the things that we really were pondering in the study of the, of John's apocalypse is, you know what? There is zero mention of the destruction of the temple. Yeah, okay. and that would have been a massive symbol for him right. to try to like configure for a church that's like under persecution and struggling, like in tremendously dire consequences. Like that would have figured large, right, in the way that right. he's telling both the story on the ground and the story cosmically. And there's no mention. So we were all like, oh, wait, 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 like if that's the case, then that actually puts the writing of John's apocalypse probably before the gospel. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I so think now right. think about that. Okay. So if John is like saying, this is the revelation, the apocalypse that God has given about his son. Huh. To John. So this is a revelation of Jesus. Yeah. Which is exactly what a gospel is, right? But it's just yeah. in a different format. Yeah. It's like, yeah. is there anything in the apocalypse that we should not be able to find in the gospel of John faithfully? I love that. Yeah. So that's instead good. of like coming in with all of our like rapture theology or our like judgment yep. theologies or like this, yep. it's like, what is happening? in the life of the church that is not what people expected that's making them very discouraged toward whether like they really thought jesus would come back tomorrow and he didn't and right. and what is john seeing as like this becomes a defining moment for them right and so you get these little letters at the beginning where he's like gonna have those seven letters to be like these this is the temptations before us right if you're going to pray the right. lord's prayer you had better see yourselves like right here in the lead me not yeah. into temptation. And yeah, so good. here I get like to the end and it's chapter 18 and it's the woes are like, you've done this and you've done this and you've done this and you've done this. And there's like 18, I think it's like the same number as the chapter, ironically, things that they have trafficked in, in terms of commerce that show that this and again, this is temple commerce that is one hundred percent now embedded in the commerce of Rome. That's right. So everything yeah. that's making money in Jerusalem is making money for Rome, and then it's working the other way as well. So think about all that when we think about the space that Jesus is entering, yeah. even though it's a couple yeah. of decades before. Yeah. And and so the language of that is like you you have taken you know ivory and bronze like he's just like going through like every continent and all the all the trade routes and then he says and even human beings yeah so slavery is the yep. last yep. thing that they left and you're just like what and wow. so it says all the merchants are like sitting out on these ships like watching this like city just like like fall into like the sea practically because it's like this is god's image of what has to happen but the way the chapter ends and the way 19 begins is that everybody's celebrating like in the heavenlies they're like Woo! because it's like now by putting that to death the true bride yeah which was supposed to be and includes god's people israel all the time can yeah. finally rise like she this had to be put to death before a resurrection yeah. can happen. And then they all just start praising, yeah. like, hallelujah, you know, the Lord, our God, the almighty reigns and all this stuff that we used to sing in those courses, like yeah, that yeah. all starts right there. <laughs> so you're like, what are they so excited about? And you realize, okay, wait, wait, wait. So now we're back with Jesus in the temple. 
And he just picks like a little moment going, okay, well, let's just look at the fact that this woman who only had this little coin to put in here, yeah. Yeah. she is poor because you made her poor. That's right. Yeah. And she is not poor because God judged her poor. Like that is what That's justice right. is, is it's judgment, yes. right? It's yeah. wise judgment. And it's truthful judgment over what is really happening. And Jesus' judgment in that moment is to go, don't you dare look at her as one who has been condemned by God. You condemned her yeah. by getting wow. in bed with the powers of this world yeah. and making this place that is supposed to be sort of the, the belly button, like the union of God and creation right here in this temple. Yep. You have turned this temple into the powers of this world, right? The den of thieves, the place yeah. where yeah. on the backs of everyone else, you will get what you want because that is the nature of the fall. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think when Jesus just like comes in with that, like Old Testament, like prophetic image, it's sort sure. of like, you know, Elijah, like eat the scroll. Jesus is going to go, right. God says, this looks nothing like me. Yeah, And if you want to cooperate with the powers of this world so that you can secure your fortunes in this world, in these economies, and then try to also get an internal life insurance policy, <laughs> you are in completely <laughs> the wrong and completely made up story. And then Jesus, but his language from whether it's the beginning, the very first thing he says in John's gospel, right, about himself is like, you know what, the temple... Is going to be destroyed and then God's going to raise it again in three days. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. Basically, he's relocating everything to and the him. economy of what God looks like in the world is yeah. going to look yeah. like a death and a resurrection. Yeah. It's it. going to look like the healing of all people as all beloved by God, none cursed by God. And how do we know? Well, we're yeah. going to let God curse himself on a tree, right? Come like yeah. none of this is going to be in the economies and Jesus is. And I had to face those things. Like, that's my temptations. And they were yeah. real or they're not temptations, right? It, do I want to go the way of the character of the living God in the world? And that means obedience to stuff that does not make friends anywhere. And it's going to get me killed pretty quickly, right? Yeah. Because yeah. the religious powers will kill me faster than anybody else. It's not yeah. Rome who's really threatened yeah. by some little guy, but I mean, if, if they are, they'll kill him. But yeah, yeah, they didn't yeah. kill him, right? It's Jesus' own people who are like, this is not the way we want to transact our relationship yep. with God. This is not the retribution that we want to see from God because it looks like laying your life down so that God yeah. could raise, like, it's all this stuff that none of us Upside want down. because actually yep. it will cost our life to be in that yeah. story with him, right? Yeah. Like the rich young ruler yeah. that you were so beautifully writing about like a couple weeks ago. Well, it's all on offer to him, but he would have to change the whole orientation and storyline yeah. of his yeah. life. And I feel like in a way, let's take the whip there and just go, Where's the whip that Jesus is using in the context with that young man is to go, watch me just go snap, right? With this whip and go, all the stuff that you constructed. I love this. I'm as sure. a way of orienting around who you think God is and all the ways that God is pleased with you and blesses you. Yeah. You're just coming to me for a plus sign next to your A report card, right? He says, sure. but if you really sure. want to know God, follow me and you yeah. will like if you yeah. really want to yeah. know god who yeah. is eternal life not to yeah. get eternal life but yeah. to, to have eternal life yeah. leave it yeah. and believe that god would be in the leaving of that that the economies that you think are god's economies are not so, so leave them and find freedom you'll have to die to all the stuff that you carry around as your report cards and your measuring sticks and your ego and identity. But what would happen if you actually met God? So right. Good. And in Luke's gospel, <laughs> it's so interesting to me that within like that little bit of discussion from that encounter, then, and it says like the guy goes away sad, right? Cause he just can't, right. he just can't right. give that up or yeah. doesn't know how to be who he 
thinks he is before the Lord. And yeah. and yet the next like crazy encounter is Zacchaeus. Right. Who yeah. knows? Like he doesn't even have a report card, right? Like he can't even come to school because <laughs> he's like kicked out. And and yet Jesus basically says the same thing to him. Like, wanna wanna be with me? Because I'd like yeah. to be with you. And here's an invitation. Yeah. And yeah. after a meal, like just listening to him, watching him with these crowds and a meal that no one else would endorse, his response is exactly yeah. the same thing that the rich and ruler has been invited to do, which is like, just everything. be free from your stuff, yeah. right? And yeah. Zacchaeus is not trying to give it away to try to feel better so that he can earn what Jesus did. He's like, oh my gosh, the, the generosity of God is like, yeah. God looks like yeah. this. Not like that. And so I think when <laughs> Jesus comes into the temple, he's already saying, this space is going to be undone because I am the temple of God. Yeah, and good. the minute I am seated with my father at the right hand, through death and resurrection, by the outpouring of the spirit, you are the temple. Like this is the beginning of First Corinthians 13 or, or yeah. First Corinthians, right? He's like, don't you know, like all the crazy divisions that you're having? He goes, have you forgotten who yours? He goes, you are the <laughs> temple of God in Corinth. And he goes, and if you Come destroy on. the temple by the crazy stuff that you're doing here, he goes, God's going to destroy this because there's nowhere else for you to look. Like yeah. you're the temple of the Holy Spirit, of the living yeah. God on the yeah. earth. And so I think all of those <laughs> dynamics are actually allowed to be at play where we could see that kind of old prophetic ways that God asks the prophet to enact something so that everybody gets their attention. And it's, as you said, without doing harm to persons, yeah, sure. it does do harm to our way of seeing ourselves and the ways that we want to move in the world. Cause it's like, oh, it's, it's about to upend them like a table yeah. and like everything yeah. else. He's like, yeah. snap. Right. And, yeah. and, serious snapping and then he's going to go but watch me because in the language of john he's like i'm going to be raised up i'm going to be enthroned on a cross not in luke with the ascension but john's ascension is the cross yeah and he's like this is the enthronement of god this is the new temple of god it's going to get cast down and then it's going to be raised up three days later yeah and once that happens you're it Right. You're yeah. it with me as the body. And so I think that in the, this kind of a year where we are going to be wooed a million different directions and headlines and yeah. podcasts yeah. and yeah. emphases to hear the siren songs that feed off of our fear. That's good. Say, yeah. If I can just elect the right person. Right. Right. I can. I can either. <laughs> Do the work of Jesus by getting the right person in place so that all the policies happen that I think Jesus would like better. Because really he's like passed along his lordship to right. yeah. one of our parties in our nation in the world. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or yeah. we are even like uglier than that, which is that it's all great to have like the lordship of Christ, but my pledge of allegiance that I have been taught since I was two or five or whatever is this nation actually has my allegiance right Jesus yeah. just has my yeah. kind of moral yeah, yeah. followership and yeah, Jesus yeah. Is like oh no 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 like this is why you have to eat right my body and drink my blood every week or how often you can do this this is why you wake up in the morning and put on the triune life of god as your baptism as a way yeah. of moving to dying and rising through Good. the day, because you are going to be lured by yeah, the powers yeah. of this world and the economies of this world to go, you know what? There are some things that you are afraid of and they're speaking to your fears. And right. Satan will be like, you know what? You might need to worry about that a little bit, or like God has sort of given this to you to be responsible for. So none of that is to say we do not need to be persons of justice in the world. But I watch Jesus justice and I'm like, I, I think he is the place where, where the divine and human are 
inseparably united. This is where justice and right and mercy kiss. Yeah, yeah. Um, right in Isaiah's well, language. Yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is where righteousness is a person. It's yeah. not a state. And he's yeah. like, I am the only one who is can make things right in myself. And yeah. I am doing that as the person on his knees serving the places of just, and all I'm asking is for my brothers and sisters to be with me where I am. And he never sat with Herod in a seat of power there. Right. And yeah, he yeah. never colluded with yeah. Caiaphas and the religious powers. And he never colluded with Rome, right? With Josephus, yeah. with the military powers. So like, I think it's Eugene Peterson who just does this beautiful thing on, I think he ended up calling it something about like practicing resurrection, but it was like, a CD set at Regent called followership or something like that. But he was just like, let's just look at Jesus who just never ever yeah. aligns himself with, let alone just even tries to pacify or just tries to be like, I know this is really troubling for you, but it'll all come out. Okay. Just like, trust me. Like, <laughs> he couldn't give a rep. Like these are the powers yeah, yeah, he had yeah. to confront where the evil ones, like, you know, God could even get God's work done. If you just want to like go with the kingdoms of this world, you could get a lot of God work done here. Oh, uh, right. If you really sure. just want to get in with the powers of the temple, like you could get the church to like God really get the work of God. Like, I think <laughs> Jesus is like, no, my church has to look like me. And boy, if the world can't see the marks of her wounds with and for a wounded world, yeah, then she needs to follow closer with me to where I am. Yeah. And so this is going to be the year where, sorry to keep harking on the sacraments, but I'm like, this is the place where we pledge allegiance, where we get realigned again to go, oh, that's right. The person who has laid his life down on this table says, now I'm going to serve you me. Yeah. And I want you to eat my yeah. body and drink my blood, John yeah. 6, to say the only way to be empowered, to remember your story and to be able to trust that justice has already had its last word in me is for you to be so attuned to where I am and what I sound like when the father says, listen to me, that you can do this. So here's a here's a last thing I'll tell you, and then we can go wherever else you want to go. Um, yeah, my husband, um, I mentioned to you earlier, um, this fall was diagnosed with this bizarre disease that hits yeah. like 1500 people a year in the United States. Wow. And until we got to the doctors and found out that from the Mayo Clinic and other researchers, like in the last two years, like this was like a, it was a pretty quick death sentence on him. But there's a new drug that they're working on. And he's part of these mm. trials. It's just astonishing. And the Lord's just been healing him, like just flat out, very wow. quietly in these processes um touching his body but we we went through an autumn where because of countless doctor's appointments for all of his different organs that were being potentially attacked mm. or all of the meetings with insurance companies for right. the urgency like you need to get yourself to the mayo clinic before anything like just and then and now that you're in this treatment like you have to keep track of like oh like all your symptomology all day long and all the wow. blood pressure like just <clears throat> by christmas time it was just anxious in our house all the time I and I, I just feel like the lord during that couple of weeks it just as i was praying and praying for my husband but also just praying like lord there just feels like so much anxiety and i don't know how to um address that it's exhausting me with this man who yeah. i love who's yeah. processing most of this out loud. And so then I just start tuning it out because it's too much for me, but I want sure. to be, I want to listen to him. Sure. So in the middle of all of all of that, the Lord is just really like, there's an invitation, Cherith, and I have one for him and I want you to offer it to him, but then I will talk to him myself. And I was like, Okay. So we had like this long conversation and I said, honey, I don't, I don't know how this is going to sound to you. And please do not hear this as like my way of like fixing anything. But I said, I feel like all of these professions, just like our politics and everything else, everything turns us in on ourselves. 
Yeah. As like, you need to be so worried about you and your place in the world and all the things that matter to you. And they yeah. look like they're extended outward, but actually they're churning all this stuff inside of you. And yeah. And the Lord was basically saying, Robert, would you like your life back? Right? Like, like this is not just about healing, but would you like to live a life yeah. that I would like to offer you, even in your sick body? Right. There's a life for you. Wow. Yeah. But you'll have to turn outward. And yeah. your focus, even though everything has been asking you to focus inward, if you focus outward, you'll become a human being again. That's good. And you're still there. Like, it's not like you're denying it, but you can be free to just be present to what That's I'm good. doing in the world and with you. And the last month to watch the ways that he has just even two days ago, coming back from the cancer ward and just sitting there like he's just weeping as he bears witness wow. to seeing the presence of Jesus huh. in seat after seat after seat where the Lord is inviting him to walk up and down and not just pray a blessing. All of a sudden, he just couldn't, he couldn't stop crying, telling me, he's like, honey, and then I just began to see Jesus sitting in wow. every one of those wow. infusion chairs. Like, like yeah. none of us had to ask Jesus to come. He's already there, just yeah. waiting wow. to put them on his lap hold them in the space, minister comfort, potential healing, yeah, forever healing for sure. Like just, and, and Robert has become such a free mm. person. Mm. And he's like, oh, I think this is also what the Lord is inviting me to just not get worked up like I was four years ago in wow. the election cycle, right? Just like, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I need yeah. to remember like where my orientation is, where yeah. my loyalty discipleship apprenticeship obedience ship who i'm walking with who i love who loves me yeah. and yeah. not give that allegiance away to anybody else because he's seated at the right hand of the father and he knows how this turns out and he is enacting his justice but would really love for us to be the temple that's him instead of trying to construct temples in his name on the earth in ways that we feel like would be a quicker route to justice and i say that as somebody who's just wept and wept and wept this fall through everything that's happening in gaza ukraine yeah. like i can hardly move some yeah. days i just have to have the lord like yeah. do something to me because i can't hardly move but yeah but then he's like okay what's getting you it's like that was a yes you can weep in intercession truth but you cannot carry these things they belong to yeah. me so right. where in your neighborhood do you see someone whose life feels like it's being lived under the rubble yeah. of a life that they can't keep from falling down on them? They become the icon that's both present to where I am in yeah. the moment, and they become the way that you can enact your prayer for these big things in the world that you can't touch, but you can touch. And so I, I guess I just feel like there's so many layers that he would invite us into that let you go right back to that whip and see both the prophetic action there but also see the final prophetic finishing right like like he promised that the covenant of the spirit is what he's giving and he's like now i would just yeah. really love you to be a people of the spirit whose whip is never in your hands it's always in mine and it's a scepter and it's actually it's a it's a piece of wood that's like from a cross if you really want to use john's language right and he's like yeah, and yeah, when yeah. you look for me you don't look for me in some enthroned place you look for me down next to you and i'm on my knees and i'm asking you how can i serve you today and i'm asking you in the process of serving you how might we then serve a world that i love and boy that just changes everything just changes yeah. everything <laughs> oh i'm sorry it. i just I like preached sorry <laughs> <laughs> it's really it good thanks for the day and i went <laughs> <laughs> it's really good i think that i'm processing even 
uh, applying it to the season we're coming into. Uh, I, and I realized I, I, there was a political implication there. Uh, and I, so I'm so glad that you've spent the time to unpack that. What's really fascinating to me about that is connected to peace. It's about peace. And uh, I love that you brought it back to the story about your husband. I know you said that, that um, he's doing better. He is. Uh, it's a, it's so a miracle. And I, we'll see how it all plays out. But yeah. whether he lives long or lives short with me, we, we are experiencing such a sense of God shalom in the middle yes. of all of it. Because yeah. boy, we're just seeing that's Jesus it. in our midst. Yeah, and that's the peace. Mm -hmm. I love the, the way that you've you remind us uh, what love looks like, you know, other centered, self giving, you, the mutuality of it. He never steps outside of consent, you know, this, this, that, that's the profound picture. But all of it in this, maybe to, to speak to the season we're in, to me, justice is, is practical theology. It's mm -hmm. cruciform love in, in, in mm -hmm. immersed in me and in you. It's, it's how do I, like you said, it's what does it look like to love my neighbor today as I'm loved by him? It's how, do, how can I grow more confident in his affection for me because we love because we're first loved. So if I can steward his affection for me, then I can give away th that same affection to the person. And that actually is justice. That's the love that transforms the world. Mm -hmm. Mercy is, is how you define justice. Yeah, I'll say this. Years ago, I was writing a book. I wrote a book called God is Not in Control, and it's about the sovereignty of love. And, I, and the, the title is probably the scariest thing about it. It's a little blunt and I clumsy. I didn't like it, it but, <laughs> but it, it. Was, uh, it, was, it was what uh, I kept coming back to, and, my, and God told me he loved it. So I was like, oh, well, that's what we'll do then. But, <laughs> but, but the, the idea was I had lots of pushback along the way, and one fellow said, well, how do we win in the end? And I said, it already happened at the cross. This thing is it's just that we're rediscovering what win looks like, and it looks mm -hmm. like laying your life down. And so uh, I, I love that, um, man, the insights you gave, the prophetic pictures, the understanding of um, a paradigm shift. I felt like that's what you were saying, that when you when you look at this, Jesus is actually saying, this is, this is not the kingdom uh, that uh, we're doing. We're doing the kingdom within you. Uh, which is uh, which is the expression of union. You know, it's the reality that eternity is now that we're actually seated at the right hand of the Father together in this moment, yes. living from that place of of yes. finished work, living from that place of of, of peace, if you will. Uh, mm -hmm. Am I am I encapsulating some of what you? I love it. I love it. And I I think one of the things that also strikes me about that image. I'm going to be like pondering that image now for weeks, but I do. I was just listening um, this morning to a class on confession and how we as church communities don't really know how to um, offer confession to one another, right? We sort of send yeah. people to therapy and think that's what's happening, but but right. just the beautiful gift of confession within community and and realize that sometimes confession is just like rough right like you just have to say what's really happening right You're like yeah wow like i i need a little table turning here right and i feel like it's sometimes where jesus brings us into um the language of that consuming fire oh, yeah. and he never harms us in there right so he's not harming anyone with the whip yeah. in the temple either but it doesn't mean that some of the stuff in that consuming fire doesn't hurt when it's getting burned up, right? Yeah. It's like, yeah. Cause, and, and I don't even know if the burning up of the stuff is the thing that hurts. It's when my hands are trying to hold on to the stuff, like, yeah. right, right. It's like, <laughs> and I feel like in Jesus, like, just like, Chair, this is the thing that's killing you is your hands. Yeah. yeah. Even more than the thing itself. Cause the thing itself, unless you commit to it, it has no power for you. Yeah. But, yeah. Your fear of releasing this and not and still being loved, right? If it's a confessional moment, or your fear of releasing yeah. this and believing that I'm trustworthy. Yeah. Like that you yeah, can just trust it. me. That's like it. That, that's, it. that's what's it all comes down that's to that. where your fingers are feeling a little singed here. And it just hurts to see um how many times I've chosen death over life in the non 
life-giving way right like like right. oh i was so willing i'm so willing to collude in something that's just not life-giving and and i think jesus really does release us right like that like that's the beauty of confession he's like i forgave you i forgive you i absolve you like the confession truth was for you to yeah. see what i'm doing with you in kindness wow. in this fire it wasn't so that you could list off a list to me like i i'm not only not holding lists of right and wrongs against you my compassion of knowing how you got here yeah. is so profoundly different compared to you like you don't even know how you got here but i do yeah. and yeah. i have compassion toward you and and so I think it's that sense of, again, like watching the temple moment with Jesus being like, this feels a little bit like sometimes it's just tenderness and wooing and drawing near. And other times he's like, can you come and stand in here? Because like, if you invite me, yeah, some stuff's going to get thrown around a little bit here. It's yeah. upheaved and you're, and you're yeah. going to have to walk away from it and say, yeah. I choose not to unite with that. Right. Yeah, that's good. Like I think the there's a lot of things. Doing. And so yeah. I think that's a very powerful image of the character of God not to do harm to us ever. But that it doesn't mean that sometimes things don't feel really upheaving and that there yeah. might be some pain that's accompanied yeah, in yeah. true repentance and true recognition yeah. of what that is and wow. the letting go of it. Chair, I think I think we are in a season of of upheaval and true repentance. Really, I mean that's an, or at least I could say this that there's an opportunity for us, even as a church, yeah, uh, as the church uh, in, in these days ahead. Um, what you said, um, confession is in the context and in, in the relational context. To me, it's you know you can't have intimacy where there isn't trust, and so confession is a is a way to to re-invite intimacy into the yeah. relationship. Yes. It's really a relational act. I mean, that's on a personal level, but I think on a larger scale, some of what you're talking about, uh, I can see the up, upheavals, mm. you know, uh, in the in our culture and in the church. And, in you know, a lot of folks who listen to this podcast are folks who've wrestled with the retributive perspective of God for so long, and mm -hmm. they've either embraced the word deconstruction or they're rethinking or they're, mm -hmm. they're just endeavoring to find perfect theology in Jesus. Yeah. And, and, uh, and there's been a, a, a kind of an upheaval, I would say in the last four years since COVID, I feel like there's just been a major upheaval and, yes. and we're still, we're still, we're, we're probably going to see more of it this year is what I, I imagine on a large scale, if you get back 30,000 feet yeah. and, uh, I'm excited though, for the, for all of those who are, who have been navigating down the road. Mm -hmm. And I think this is maybe what I was, what I'm processing. I'm like, man, there are so many people now that can speak to restorative justice, meaning, a a, a justice that loves. And, and I, I think we're, we're in a season where there are folks mm -hmm. beginning to put language to that, if you will, and an understanding around that, that, in, that is, that follows the way of peace, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, I have, um, I have like a pile of things I was going to ask you. And then I went over there and did that restorative wit thing. <laughs> oh, I love that. We'll just have to chat again. But no, thank you for... Thank you for just bringing you and the things that you're thinking about. And sorry oh, if I goodness. like went off too long on any of. No, the things it was so. Think about that was so helpful. I, for me too. I, 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 we do have to do this again. Do you have time for tacos? I do. I have a real fast. Uh, my family's just like, what's my like fundamental taco story? And I realized that as a kid growing up in Southern California, my mother would make tacos for our family my three brothers and me and they were really comfort food right it was just like basic like spicy hamburger and like all this stuff on it and yeah. and yeah. we American... all loved it right it was not ever a meal where like some of us liked it and some of us didn't which yep. it was yep. it was the meal we all are like yay <laughs> and so then 
I think it's like any other comfort food. Like once it gets locked in, like that's what a good taco tastes like. And I don't even know if my mother made great tacos, but they were <laughs> great to us, right? They have nostalgia and, attached to them. And so, and again, like we were like the very, uh, we didn't have a whole lot. And I think like even just stretching like hamburger was like a lot for my mom. But but I remember meeting with some former students who were pastoring in Seattle, probably about six, eight years ago, and they were making fish tacos. Uh -huh. And I remember just being like, you know, I've seen these on menus like lots of times, but I... I would never order a fish taco on a menu because it wasn't <laughs> my comfort food. Right. And yeah, yeah. when I had that taco, I was just like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was like deconstruction or reconstruction. I was like, oh, the tacos could be like tacos. Like there's a whole world of tacos out there and they're all yeah. really good. And so I just remember like everything was fresh, everything was beautiful, and it was so tasty that the only thing my husband was like, so you were doing like this with like the folks from like Grace Communion International, and you were doing this for like, it's like, no, I want to tell you about the tacos that I had at Pentecost. <laughs> <He's> like, okay. <laughs> so anyway, I just, I feel like it makes me laugh when I see that. And then my kids, like, right, they all have their little books for the, my grandchildren where... It's the dragons who eat tacos. So I'm like, uh -huh. yeah, we know that one. Tacos yeah. in there. I, I'm yeah. redeeming <laughs> all tacos through your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it. And the dragons who eat tacos. I, I, I know that book. <laughs> no it's salsa. So much... What's that? And it's oh, no yeah. salsa, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, yeah, I was the same. We grew up with taco salad and, uh, like we called it Skull Valley because my mom had learned how to make it from somebody who created it in Skull Valley, Arizona. So it was really cool. It had a cool name, but it was, it's not mm -hmm. like you. We would yeah. have kids over and we'd be like, we're having Skull Valley. And then one day someone said, you mean taco salad? And I was like, well, I guess. But <laughs> but, but same, it was it was all, all the kids loved it. That And even in our house now, all our kids, uh, that's the one night where everybody's everybody's, everybody's happy. In. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's like, in. Everybody's happy. And. That's good. See, what a um, good name for your podcast. Because if it's the meal right? where like everybody's in, even everybody's if we have in, the different it, flavors that we like more, we like them all, right? It's like, okay, let's make room for them all. So I love that's it. That's right. Inclusion, <laughs> inclusion in tacos with friends. A room love icon is serving like tacos at the table of the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. That's exactly right. Um uh, how is, uh, is there, um, uh, your husband's name? His name is Robert. Robert. Yeah. I thought you said that. And he would be well, so just... delighted for your prayers. And he would also like yeah. be careful. Cause if you like contact Robert, like he'll just talk about Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Cause he's just having so much, so much, uh, fun. Like it was the first week that he found all of this out and he was just walking our dog in the neighborhood and this elderly man came up to him, started talking to him, beautiful conversation. And at the end, the old man just says, could I just pray for you? Could I pray for your wife? Like and he knew nothing about anything. Like Robert did not share any of this. And he just stands in the street corner and just starts praying, which is not really typical of our neighborhood. And then... He says, oh, Robert says, well, my name's Robert. It's been so great to be with you. He goes, what's your name? And he says, Emmanuel. <laughs> <laughs> he walks away. And Robert has looked for him and has wow. not seen him. Like, he came home just crying because I, like, the, uh, this experience has made him very weepy. But he says, I just, he was, like, shaking. He says, I've wow. encountered the Lord. And that was at the beginning. And yeah. Brad wow. just, like, just, like, okay, Robert, like, here's how to, like, pray about that and so it's just been really fun wow. to watch what god is doing and at the same time just hold the whole of robert's life in in the bosom of jesus with the father you know so i don't mean wow. that lightly we've been no. a lot of places but we are home right we're home where we need to be in and the first thing jesus said to us when it all came out was you you know i already 
knew about this and you know yeah. i've been holding this for you until this day when you were going to find out about it i was like oh that's right there's nothing that is going to happen here that is outside anything that you're doing yeah. please keep me from praying in a way that tries to invite you in to wow. something that actually you're letting oh, robert oh. suffering belong to you because it always has right it's your suffering yeah. first and so now yeah. robert's suffering becomes a way another way that he gets yeah. to participate with jesus so thank you for praying for him i think it's yeah. becoming a real gift um in all of our lives but it's it's the real deal and i'm grateful to the lord i do pray you know, i do pray that there's a, a measureless revelation of his of our father's affection and thank a you. sense of his wonder and joy and life and peace and wholeness over you and robert both thank you. In Jesus' name. And we, we agree you. on that. Amen. Uh, and as a listeners too, in Jesus' name. Um, uh, it's been such a privilege and an honor to talk with you. I think maybe we shouldn't wait a year for the <laughs> next time. but And we don't have to record it, but I do have more, more things I could ask you. I, I certainly would, would, would love to talk about uh, other things with you as well. But I, I'm enriched every time I get to connect with you. I feel... Um, I feel I feel my father's affection when you talk. Mm. I feel Holy Spirit's kindness and mm, Jesus' likewise. friendship when you talk. Likewise. So <laughs> I love you. it. Please invite Thanks. me because it's likewise. Hey guys. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you'd like to learn more about the podcast, myself or our guests, you can go to a familystory.org. You can also go to a familystory.org. If you'd like to give, this is a listener supported podcast and we are incredibly grateful for your generosity. Hey, we have a Facebook group and it's pretty cool. Rethinking God with Tacos. You can join us over there. Lots of incredible conversation and community taking place on that page. And you can also follow us on all the socials, Instagram, uh, TikTok, YouTube, and others. Hey, I'd love it also if you uh, went on iTunes and left a review or shared or tweeted or liked the podcast. Uh, let your friends know that this is a good place to hear about the love of God. I pray grace and wonder over your day.